Our topic this evening is which sayings of Jesus are authentic? Um, and so I think when we're talking about authenticity, we also have to consider, step back and consider on which Jesus we mean, what would Jesus we're talking about when we're talking about the sayings being authentic. Um, when we posted the preview for this, um, I think we had a um, fervent believing Christian who wrote back and, and said, all of Jesus' sayings are authentic. And so the question is, which, which Jesus are we, are we talking about? So for Christians operating within the context of worship, so the practice of their individual faith communities, it may be that all of the sayings of Jesus recorded in Scripture are authentic for that religious and spiritual purpose. So um, when that is happening, Christians are encountering the Jesus of Scripture, the Jesus of sacred story, and that is possibly pointing them to the Christ of theology, the lens through which Christians experience the divine traditionally. Um, but when they're doing that, um, a lot of Christians who uh, aren't historians, almost everybody, very few of us are, um, just make the assumption that the texts probably are history books and these are, this is a, talking about things as they happened. Um, and this is an assumption that has existed a lot in the modern era when we prioritize historicity. Um, we talk about this a lot. We will say things like when people say a story and you, you're t telling some kind of a story and they say, you know, is that, is that true? And so the, the true, when, that, when you're asking that even, just even that framework of true, that's a historicity question. Did that happen exactly as narrated uh, journalistically as opposed to you know, which is kind of a weird, actually, modern bias about truth. Um, you know, truth could otherwise be applied uh, not to whether something happened or not, but whether um, is that expressing a true principle? Is this, is this narration have meaning? And so I would like um, people to consider stepping back from that um, lens of historicity when we have these kinds of discussions. And so we were just looking at this picture of the Christ Pantocrator from St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai uh, from late antiquity, the very uh, end of antiquity, the beginning of the Middle Ages. And uh, on the left here is the picture as it's painted. And then, as we know, if, you, if you, our faces are all um, kind of not mirror perfect with each other, but what we find out is that this painting is especially not mirror perfect. So if you take uh, the next two images here, that is not how the painting actually exists. That's a digital uh, mirroring where you take the left side and mirror it, and then the right side and mirror it. Um, so this picture, um, is a theological portrait. It is not um, a historical portrait. There is um, no particular reason to imagine that the historical Jesus looked anything like this, but what uh, the painter is trying to do is not do something about history. They're talking about, about a different kind of truth. A theological truth is what they're trying to express, and this is uh, the monk who painted this is profession that they believe um, in a Jesus of worship, a Jesus of scripture, of theology, who is fully human and fully divine, and they have artistically combined that. Not in any literalistic sense, this is not literalistically how that would uh, express that principle, but symbolically and artistically. Um, and I think we're ready to believe in paintings as being artwork, but we somehow have trouble with literature as being artwork. <laughs> and certainly um, the Gospels are artwork, they are literature. So they are representing theological portraiture 
again, not historical portraiture. And it's just as clear as that portrait of Christ's Pantocrator. The, um, the Gospels uh, make that very clear when you study them closely and you see how they are put together as literary creations. Um, it's very clear that they are artwork showing meaning, showing truth, but when you ask are they true and you mean, does that mean are they history, you are missing out on what the idea is about true. So I want to have that as our grounding here. As we've seen in previous lectures, all of these texts were written by uh, anonymous, non-eyewitness uh, Christians. They were only later assigned by tradition uh, the names Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And so when I'm on my toes and I'm saying it right, I will always say the author of Luke says this, but if I just use the word Luke as a shorthand, I'm not intending to say it was a historical personage, uh, the companion of, of Paul who um, uh, in other descriptions is called a doctor. That, um, that historical figure um, is almost certainly not the author of the text. So um, what I was just saying here is that each one of these anonymous authors, and then John has multiple authors, probably, I mean, definitely, uh, is writing with uh, a very different purpose and a different focus than history. Luke uh, is the only one that gets close to uh, considering history. They're writing in the, um, in the literary genre of uh, Hellenistic history, but Hellenistic history is also very, very different from, uh, as a literary art, artistry, uh, from modern academic history. I think it doesn't hurt uh, to also consider, again, as we're talking about which Jesus we're talking about for the authenticity, what we're trying to get at in this presentation is the historical Jesus, but we have to look through the Jesus of Scripture in order to get to that. So many times, like I say, Christians, when they're reading gospel accounts in the Bible, they simply assume that they're effectively reading a biography or a history of things that happened. They assume that, yes, I'm experiencing the historical Jesus in reading this text, but actually they are reading and experiencing the Jesus Christ of Scripture. Um, like I say, you have that misimpression because there's a widespread misunderstanding of what the texts are and where they came from. And so, like I say, each text individually, the evangelist who's writing it is painting a word portrait that is also a, a religious testimony. It is making um, a theological pitch to you as opposed to simply um, being some kind of an, a chronicler who is saying, oh, and this happened, and then this happened, you know, a list of things that happened and don't have any meaning in particular. Uh, it's rather a, a recounting of meaning, a word portrait. So even when there's that awareness, um, again, some Christians will still assume uh, that the authors are basing their accounts directly on the historical Jesus, as we've seen. Uh, they're not. Um, they're not eyewitness accounts. There is, uh, they are, in fact, written by Christians, these anonymous evangelists, people who are part of Christian communities who already believe in the ris risen Christ, and though that belief is based on testimonies of uh, apostles and prophets, Christian apostles and prophets speaking in the Spirit, who have had visions of the risen Christ, who have that anchoring their testimony, and who are also speaking and sharing teachings and proclaiming the good news based on those um, spiritual and visionary experiences. Now, some of those um, uh, apostles and prophets at the very beginning did have a lot of experience with the historical Jesus, so there is uh, memory. And as we're talking about sayings, there is also a bunch of teachings that the historical Jesus had that are floating around in oral tradition. He didn't write any texts himself, 
uh, and many of those potentially have been passed around uh, and then are ultimately written down. And so that's what we're going to explore today. Um, you know, just as much though of a source is, and actually more of a source, for the content in the Gospels uh, is actually the Septuagint Bible, uh, the uh, Old Testament. So, we want to do this for today, we are talking about history and we want to separate history from religion. So, the Jesus Christ of Scripture uh, are part of the religious experience of Christians that point Christians to the risen Christ. The historical Jesus, though, that we're looking for today can be accessed only through the academic disciplines of history, literary criticism, and other su uh, supporting um, disciplines like archaeology to some extent, you know, just for historical context and that kind of thing. There's no artifacts, of course. So, um, the authenticity that we're seeking in this presentation um, is an academic exploration of which sayings out of all of the collection of sayings in every source um, can potentially be traced to the historical Jesus. Um, this is a uh, exploration I think that is of interest to historians and historical enthusiasts. Um, but I don't think it should necessarily be used um, if you are coming into this and as, a, as a Christian, or I guess only Christians really care. <laughs> so if you're coming to it religiously as a Christian, um, it shouldn't necessarily change any part of the religious authority of any part of the scripture, because the scripture is not history anyway. Uh, I've said a bunch of times that if Christians are even worried about this, they should just take as a default assumption that it's not history, and then you can put a point on things where we say, okay, this was history, this happened, that's what we should be, uh, or this likely happened, as opposed to um, making the other assumption. Likewise, this exploration, though, is not an argument I'm making here designed to demonstrate the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth, which I've attempted to make elsewhere. We have a lecture on that. So when you're doing that kind of an argument, academic argument to demonstrate Jesus' historicity, which um, by far and away the all majority of um, scholars in this field do, but I mention this because it is such a popular idea um, on the internet, that uh, the alternate idea. Uh, anyway, that is not what I'm arguing about. Here, we're already taking um, that demonstration as a given, so for all of you who that's your thing. I just want you to step back from that. And now what I'm trying to say is, if we take this as a given, not, not everything that I'm saying here is like proving that a historical Jesus exists. It's not doing that at all. It's once we've decided that, which we can always go back and argue it at a different time. Once we've decided that, what can we try to um, build from that foundation as we um, now are able to look at the different sources and use disciplines like literary criticism um, to sift through all of the different sayings, which are so contradictory, which some of which are clearly anachronistic and other issues, so that we can kind of see possibly which ones are most likely to go back to the historical Jesus. Um, there are a wi much wider traditions um, of Jesus sayings than most people are aware of. So if we take the whole first millennium uh, of the common era, the first millennium AD, there was a wide proliferation of texts that attribute sayings to Jesus. So many of these are found in what are sometimes called the lost books of the Bible, the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, um, uh, texts that were once scripture to individual Christian communities or sects. So all of the different Gnostic Gospels, uh, the different Ebionite and uh, Jewish Christian texts, um, the uh, Docetic Gospels, in other words, different ones that uh, were scripture to their community, um, but then were left out of the canon when 
proto-Orthodox Christianity emerged sort of victorious and uh, defined the other perspectives uh, as illegitimate, as heresy. And so as a result, um, there are other texts, and lots of these have sayings. Um, and then outside of that variety of Christianity, um, Christianity's related traditions, uh, the Abrahamic traditions, Judaism and Islam, um, have mentions of Jesus, and in the case of Islam especially, um, of sayings and teachings and understandings. And um, it's not always widely known how, how rich that tradition is among Christians. So this um, picture here, 16th century Persian miniature, is showing Mary and then the little baby Jesus who's in this divine uh, flames showing this kind of Madonna and child picture that is a fully Muslim uh, picture. So unfortunately, um, uh, these Trish traditions from outside Christianity are too late uh, to provide much of an independent witness. In some cases, um, um, the Islamic ideas are based, are, are inheritors of some of the uh, Ebionite ideas, um, but, but um, probably don't represent an independent witness that goes all the way back, and almost certainly doesn't go all the way back, therefore, to um, uh, the historical Jesus. And, you know, we sometimes, when we're talking about the historical Jesus, we, we turn to our old friend, or not friend, friend to history, not, not a friend certainly to his own people, <laughs> uh, Flavius Josephus, uh, the Jewish Roman historian. We um, use him as a key source since he wrote so prolifically about uh, the life of Jews and Judeans in uh, the first century of the Common Era. Um, however, you know, in his very limited problematic mention of Jesus, he doesn't attribute any sayings to Jesus. So he's really useful for context, but not for certainly the source we're looking at right now, which is sayings. And neither does any of the other non-Christian historians, pagan historians of the time, like Tacitus. So there's no, no preserved sayings of, T, of Jesus in, the, in that scope. And so that's going to bring us back always and problematically uh, to just the Christian sources. And, um, and so therefore they have to be read when we're reading them for getting at the historical Jesus. We have to read them with the intention of the authors in mind. They are fervent believers in um, a Christian theological proposition as they're, as they're talking. Um, normally, uh, whenever we have one of these lectures, you know, Paul, who's our first Christian writer, who is a historical figure who had firsthand contact with Jesus' brother and other disciples, Peter and John. Normally, uh, Paul is the first stop on our list when we are making a connection to the historical Jesus. Um, but Paul's faith is primarily uh, in the risen Christ. And his theological proposition really is that Christ, which is a Greek word, you know, English of the Greek for Messiah, uh, the, the anointed one, but the idea of it is, his idea of it is Christ, uh, uh, Jesus, the risen Christ, is also Lord, which means um, the unseeable, unknowable God, the creator in Judaism, who even whose, not image, but much less his name shouldn't be said aloud, um, what can be felt and seen is the glory of God, and that's expressed throughout the um, Hebrew Bible, and that is expressed with the word Lord, uh, the glory of God, which is in some way a hypostasis or hypostasis of God, the seeable, the visible part, God's love made manifest, that is what Christ is, or that is who Christ is. And so Paul is really, really excited about that, and he's also excited about um, his, most, his biggest interest in the historical Jesus is the idea that because the historical Jesus died and, uh, and now is the risen Christ in Paul's faith, as Paul has had a vision to this effect, um, uh, that means the end of the world is also coming. And so Paul, for Paul anyway, he who believes in a literal end of the world, 
um, he believes that uh, he will also be resurrected and, and achieve uh, life in a new spiritual world that um, is with a, you know, a spiritualized world, a kingdom of God on earth that is without injustice, that is full of peace and, uh, and where uh, wickedness no longer exists, pain and sorrow are all gone, death is totally defeated. And so, yes, was Paul aware that was Jesus was wandering around and teaching things and was a, uh, was a great teacher? Sure, but he doesn't really care. <laughs> so he's not concerned with that at all. Um, and that's perfectly fine when you have, a, you can understand that within a tradition. People have very, very different perspectives within a tradition. So Paul is fixated on the kinds of things that he's fixated on. There were other um, uh, Christian communities, Christian writers, you know, we don't know their names, but who were producing um, sayings gospels. So for them, in some cases, they are totally disinterested with this idea that uh, Jesus is resurrected according to some people who have seen a vision of him. They don't, that's not their thing. They were excited about the teachings, the sayings. They have been sharing these uh, orally, and now at a certain point, the, the, those communities value them so much that as um, as they no longer have first-hand witnesses, they're writing down the teachings as they remember him. Um, so that, that's what's important to them. Uh, and others have you know, other, other priorities within a very diverse uh, religious community. So one really rare instance of um, Paul actually quoting Jesus uh, is his quotation of Jesus at the Last Supper which he writes and records to his um, community at Corinth in his first letter, letter to the Corinthians. Um, and so this probably had already become part of a formula for Christians sharing ritual or sacred meals together, um, kind of the origin for the sacramental practice of Eucharist or communion, sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And so Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was given and betrayed, so again, the Last Supper story, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Um, and so there's a quotation um, of Jesus in Paul, you know, the, the historical Jesus, or a quotation of Jesus uh, prior to his um, uh, death and resurrection, so not a visionary statement. Um, and so we, we, this is a potential statement that we can look to to see how likely that is to go to the historical Jesus. Um, that same saying of Jesus has a parallel in Luke 22:19, so Luke's version of the Last Supper story. The author of Luke is writing many decades later, uh, writing to a primarily um, Gentile or formerly pagan, now you know, Greek-speaking um, Christians who were not formerly Jewish audience. Um, however, and so in other words, the kind of people that would be Luke's community, I'm sorry, uh, Paul's, one of Paul's communities, However, since Luke does not seem to have had access to Paul's letters, um, if, if Luke had access to Paul's letters, we would imagine that those, Luke made use of sources when Luke had the sources, the author of Luke. And so because the author of Luke is also the author of Acts, uh, if they had had all of these different um, teachings and sayings and sermons and, and admonitions from Paul, those would probably have made their way into Acts. And also, and that's, that's kind of a negative uh, argument because it's an argument from something that's not in Acts, but it seems sensible. And then, uh, and then the other thing is, though, that there are significant contradictions between the story as described in Acts and uh, how Paul describes uh, Paul's own ministry in, the, in Paul's letters. And we've talked about that very recently. We had a lecture a uh, month ago on... Uh, why Paul's church is one. It was a description of Paul and Acts and that kind of thing. So this uh, parallel that we have in Luke um, is very close to um, what Paul had written in his letter to the Corinthians. 
Then he, Jesus, gave, I'm sorry, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So you can see how maybe this um, same kind of saying is being transmitted orally, and so it is already a formula that uh, exists in Paul's time. Um, and so that even though Paul had never met the historical Jesus, and in fact hadn't spent a lot of time hanging out with the historical Jesus apostles, uh, Paul says he met them on a couple of occasions, but largely um, he felt he had his own calling, he had his own ideas and priorities, and uh, he went off and started founding churches on his own without a lot of uh, uh, in local instruction or anything. And so as a result, he might not have been told by all of these guys all of these sayings that they found to be so important. Instead, he had seen this ritual, he'd heard this ritual formula uh, for uh, what becomes a sacrament, the sacrament of communion, sharing um, a sacred meal in community. Um, he knows that... Uh, that this formula is said when you're doing it. This is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. So, as we're looking at what the possible independent witnesses uh, to gather uh, or to evaluate, um, one to draw from, but then also then to evaluate the different sayings, because we're gonna want to see, for example, if different sources have multiple independent witnesses. So, Paul's letters are our earliest, but we're not going to get a lot of sayings out of Paul's letters. Um, pretty much I showed you the best one. <laughs> um, there's uh, also uh, uh, the sayings gospel that I've talked about. It's lost, but it's hypothetically reconstructed. Uh, the Q sayings source, which is one of the sources most scholars agree uh, for the gospels of Mar uh, Matthew and Luke. So that's a, an early saying, collection of sayings. Mark, the first um, narrative gospel, that's essentially telling a story of uh, the three years or so of Jesus' ministry, focusing especially uh, attention on the last week, the Passion Week, Easter week. But Mark also preserving um, a bunch of sayings, not anywhere near you know, the, the whole number that exists in Matthew or Luke because of the Q source, but preserving sayings as well. Then we have Matthew, which includes all the material that we have from Q, and also um, almost all of Mark. And then it includes additional material that exists only in Matthew, so the Matthaean source, the M source. Same, same story again now for Luke, so Luke's Gospel contains all of Q and a bunch of Mark. Luke deletes some of Mark, um, but then has way more Lucan material that doesn't exist anywhere else, and so that's our L source. Um, up outside of the um, Proto-Orthodox and Orthodox Christian communities, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, which uh, is another sayings gospel, um, it's sometimes considered a proto-Gnostic gospel or a Gnosticizing gospel because it's later used by uh, a Gnostic community in Egypt and translated into uh, Coptic, the Egyptian language. And, um, uh, and so that also, um, it's not, not totally indisputed. Many scholars, um, though, think that Thomas preserves an independent uh, witness here and I'm pretty convinced of that. Um, John, uh, the other of the canonical Gospels, um, which though is, although it has lots and lots of sayings of Jesus, um, they are uh, kind of problematic in terms of whether or not they, any of them go back much, you know, or which ones of them go back to a historical Jesus, and we'll explain kind of why as we're going through this. Then beyond those, we have other New Testament traditions. So we've talked about the, uh, the, the Jacobin church, the church of uh, Jesus' brother James. So there are um, 
test, uh, writings in the New Testament that reflect that tradition, including the Epistle of James, the Epistles of First and Second Peter, the Epistle of Jude, the um, possibly the Apocalypse of John. Some of those have some sayings of Jesus embedded in them. Others, like James, have sayings that we would otherwise attribute to Jesus that James just says them, and so it's like they have a shared wisdom in whether or not, you know, John the Baptist was the first guy that says that, or Jesus, or James, or somebody else. Um, it is now just part of the common wisdom within that group is what it seems like. Uh, also, then we have been beyond the Gospel of Thomas. There are other early apocryphal books, maybe the fragment of the Gospel of Peter. Um, some scholars, anyway, think that that preserves an independent uh, witness. And then there may be within the traditions of other very early Christian writers, like Polycarp and Clement, who quote Jesus and um, uh, and, and they quote Jesus with sayings, for example, that sometimes are found in all of the rest of these sources, but other times um, are not in any other source. Maybe they have traditions that are going back as well to the historical Jesus. So I think this is kind of our kind of broad categories, but I'm going to um, focus in mostly on the, the ones that I put in colors here and acknowledging that there's other um, possibilities. Um, this is a this is not going to be, this is not a comprehensive presentation, but it's one that is just giving us a sense of how we can approach this topic. So, so we're just putting this um, into our timeline context. Um, so we're just starting here uh, at the you know, left and moving to the right in the 20s and 30s, the ministries of John the Baptist and Jesus, the beginnings of this uh, group, uh, the group continuing. Uh, to be led by Jesus' brother James, who is located in Jerusalem until uh, his execution. So all of that, um, those groups speaking primarily their language Aramaic, not producing texts, it seems. If they did produce a text that hasn't uh, survived, but they maybe didn't think that, see the need for it as they were actively all engaged uh, together at the time and, and had um, immediate memory of of the past teachers, so James continued to be alive for a whole long time. Um, during the course of that, you can kind of see here in the um, uh, 30s, Paul converting, and then at a certain point, um, uh, because of, uh, anyway, his ministry changed and he started needing to, or feeling the need, um, to start writing to the various churches that he had found in order to give them instruction in a lot of cases because um, he was being challenged by other Christian groups. We've suggested that that's especially maybe James's church uh, and Peter and so on, James and John, uh, but other, others too, people that um, Paul calls the circumcision faction or the super apostles. Um, um, Paul starts uh, writing instructions to justify his teachings. There's only one of him, and he has companions and things like that, but he wants to make sure all of these churches that he's planted continue to understand what he thinks is the most important parts of Christianity. So those are all going on. You can kind of see there in the 50s, the authentic letters of Paul. Um, in the 50s also may be when this sayings gospel Q could have been written. Um, again, we, it's been lost. It's only hypothetical in that it's been reconstructed out of um, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. It's our best explanation for why um, they have this overlap, what it seems to be um, a quotation from a lost source in addition to the fact that they're quoting the Gospel of Mark. And so, though, this, that, no matter how early it is, uh, the, the sayings that are in queue, no matter how much those also seem to reflect a very earlier stage of Christianity um, and talk more about the environment of Galilee, which is where the historical Jesus was from, and tell teachings that are really focused on um, the principles and things that you're experiencing in, in rural life, 
So less teachings that are about uh, things that are going on in the city, more teachings that are going on out on the farm. Um, uh, you know, all the sowers and all of the other kinds of, um, you know, vineyard parables and all these kind of things are, are, are embedded into that. So there's a lot of reasons why um, these, all these cue sayings seem to be getting us closer to the historical Jesus, but there's still a, a distance because, again, you can see how it's still, uh, um, whatever that is, 20 years at the early, at the least, um, from the historical Jesus, and there's a language jump. Um, then we have the calamity from the standpoint of uh, Judea of the um, Roman Jewish War from 66 to 73, which upends everything. Uh, and so that has um, sees the end of the Jamesian church existing in Jerusalem. They flee to uh, the city of Pella uh, in the region, but no longer based in Jerusalem, which is destroyed. Um, these ap ap apocalyptic events <laughs> make uh, the author of Mark uh, confirm to the author of Mark that the world is coming to an end. And so the author of Mark decides to uh, compose the first narrative gospel within that context, um, within the context of the evangelist who is composing it. It is very uh, uh, confident that the uh, world will literally end within three or four years. Uh, that doesn't happen, um, but uh, people like the, the they like the idea of Mark's gospel. They like the idea of Mark's gospel a lot more than they like Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel has a lot of really weird ideas uh, from as far as all the rest of Christians are concerned. So many of the rest of Christians um, have been influenced by Paul and Paul's writings, and they're all about the risen Christ. The Gospel of Mark, as written, um, has essentially the theological proposition that Christ hasn't come back yet. He's about to come back. Uh, and so uh, the uh, authors of Matthew and Luke get a hold of this. Uh, the author of Luke is especially critical of the sources and say, so many people have tried to write these events and they've done kind of a terrible job, therefore I'm going to try my hand at it. Uh, and that is... Um, uh, where how we are hypothesizing that independently the authors of Matthew and Luke are each uh, have in front of them Q and Mark and they each compose their own uh, new gospel which they think is going to supersede all the other gospels and it'll be the only gospel and nobody will ever read Mark again and nobody will ever read Q again and that almost happened for Mark but it did happen for Q. Meanwhile, in the Johannine community, another entire tradition, um, there are various stages of the gospel leading to the gospel of John as we have it by the end of the first century. So that's our kind of general context and timeline for these um, earliest sources for considering these sayings. So as we're going to now look at um, which of these back to the historical Jesus, or not all the way, but just most likely to be. Um, what are some of the tools so of the trade here in literary criticism? So one of them is multiple attestation. So do we find multiple unique sources? Um, and it's always nice when the sources contradict or have a different perspective than each other. So if you have one that uh, doesn't agree with uh, the other. Are the sayings um, contrary to a later Christian understanding? And so, you know, we have, I've told you, this um, very elaborate um, Christ theology that Paul develops. Um, if that is, when that is, let's say, retrojected to the historical Jesus, um, and Jesus talks like Paul ever, you know, that kind of a thing, or... Um, or, for example, if uh, we're talking about um, developments in the Christian community or arguments that Christians are having with each other, like the argument between Paul's church and the Jamesian church over whether or not adherence to G Jewish law is still necessary, then that is, a again, an anachronism. It is coming from the time 
uh, when people are caring about that, not from the time of the historical Jesus, which who wouldn't have worried about that or had those kind of concerns. Then there's the criterion of embarrassment. So were later Christians embarrassed by this kind of detail? Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, one of the sayings has Jesus saying that um, John came you know, fasting uh, and you didn't listen to him. Uh, the Son of Man, Jesus here, has come uh, drinking and eating, and, and you don't, um, you also reject him. Um, this is kind of a, uh, a, a criticism. The criticism is, is being uh, waged on Jesus here is that he hasn't been doing all this fasting. Yes, there's a story of him fasting in the wilderness, um, you know, before the beginning of his ministry, but that his public ministry thereafter did not involve uh, the discipline, ascetic disciplines of fasting the way John the Baptist was such an ascetic. And so that was potentially embarrassing um, for later Christians, and so they wouldn't make that up because they found it embarrassing and they tried to explain it away. They said things like, well, um, this time of fasting will come after the Son of Man is taken from you. So there would be like a, again, a Christian apologetic to explain away a detail of the historical Jesus maybe's uh, life and actual ministry that is embarrassing. Okay, so another tool always is, you know, is this you know, consistent with the rest of the historical record? Um, are there just anachronisms that, you know, couldn't, couldn't be the case if Jesus is talking about something uh, that doesn't exist yet? That kind of a thing. Uh, finally, when we're talking about sayings that have to, um, that aren't immediately written down after Jesus said them, they are sayings that have to be able to survive through an oral transmission process. So Jesus left no writings. Uh, none of our sayings are eyewitness. They're not in the language he spoke, Aramaic. So the transmission is oral. So when you have an oral transmission, uh, transmission, yeah, <laughs> you need, especially um, if you have like a, a short, uh, you know, a pithy saying, something that is, you know, rolls off the tongue uh, and is easy to remember, uh, you know, blessed are the poor. It's very easy to have um, something like that that is not, you know, not hard to remember because it's short and pithy. Otherwise, mem otherwise you can also do memorable uh, sayings and teachings that are a little longer when they have a teaching tool. So when you're telling a, a story like a parable, a parable will often have a um, a, a normal, a memor memorizable oral narrative structure where you'll have like three parts and then a conclusion. Um, those are things that can survive through an oral transmission uh, process. That's different than if you have like, um, let's say Jesus going back and forth in a, in a conversation or Jesus making a big, uh, long speech. Um, big, long speeches uh, in in Greek writing of the time, those are almost always the uh, composition of an author, whoever the author is that's writing. It's not likely that the, um, even the, the ancient historian who is trying to um, you know, record what a general is saying before a big war, and they give the whole big speech that the general uses to, to rally the troops, that's what the historian the ancient historian felt like should have been said on that occasion as opposed to anybody was taking notes or remembers or anything like that, that they have a witness in any way. And the same thing would be true for um, long speeches, especially the kind that we find uh, in the Gospel of John. So those would be less likely as opposed to things that can survive through an oral transmission process. So we said it a couple times, but it's nice to visualize it. Jesus' spoken uh, teachings are in Aramaic. There's 20 to 40 years of oral tradition where uh, people who heard him continue to say the things and repeat the teachings that he said, sometimes attributing them back to him because of uh, valuing him as an authority, other times just valuing the wisdom itself and just passing it on without attribution even. 
but also in the middle of a, um, a spiritual process, um, the people who are speaking are also um, apostles and prophets who are themselves speaking in the spirit, and they might have uh, they might have a new twist on the teaching, and so the teaching can change in an oral tradition too. Um, at some point or other, as uh, so many Greek speakers are converted, um, there is a oral transmission where um, bilingual people are essentially, who know the Aramaic version, are saying the Aramaic things to Greek-speaking people, and so now those sayings are being known in Greek. And then um, the Greek, speaking, Greek versions of the sayings uh, began to be written down in sources like Q and Mark and then the other subsequent sources that are written in Greek. We don't have the independent uh, transmission into Aramaic. Most of our oldest Aramaic, uh, fully Aramaic sources are actually in return, brought back from the Greek, so they're being based on the Greek sources. So let's examine, with all of that kind of background and tools, let's examine some of the sayings of Jesus. This is not going to be, there are too many sayings of Jesus for me to go through and give you all a list. This one's authentic, this one's not, that's not what we're doing. I just want to give you these tools so that we can consider them and you can uh, apply these kinds of tools yourself as uh, uh, with, I'm going to give you some resources as well, or, or recommend some resources, um, so that we can consider whether they might be more authentic or less authentic, again, to the historical Jesus. So, um, you know, here we have uh, Jesus saying, blessed are the poor in spirit in the Sermon on the Mount, and our skeptical guy in this famous now meme is saying, if the author of Matthew compiled all the sayings together to create the Sermon on the Mount. In other words, that is not a historical sermon. It is a collection of sayings that are organized specifically by the author of Matthew in order to um, make a particular point. Did you know, this guy wonder the historical Jesus say any of this? Uh, our skeptic behind is actually wondering about this. Is it really blessed are the poor in spirit like we have it in Matthew? So, um, multiple attestations, not our only criterion. Um, it exists, where it exists, it illustrates that a teaching is circulating in the oral tradition of Christianity and more than one community has access to it and they have written it down and they often write down different variants of it. And that helps us, when we have more than one variant, then we can look at them and weigh them and try to see, well, which one of those is more likely to go back. And so that's always helpful. If you only ever have you know, one source, you have so fewer tools to decide, um, you know, authenticity or historical authenticity, historicity. Uh, and so we've talked about that. We, it's ha the fact that we have four canonical gospels um, at, covering the period that they cover gives us so much more insight to that period than we have for, unfortunately, the book of Acts, where we really only have Acts and then what, what Paul writes. Um, if we had had, if we had three books of Acts, we would know so much more about early Christianity, uh, especially if they contradicted each other a lot, which I, I think they would. So um, there's an example here uh, of one of these sayings that have multiple attestation. The complaint that Jesus gives when his ministry is rejected by the people of Nazareth, his home uh, town, which is found in Mark, John and Thomas, and then we also have variants in Matthew and Luke, but of course um, those are literarily dependent on Mark, so those two evangelists are using Mark. So the independent sources are Mark, Luke, and Thomas. So Mark says, it, it writes that Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor except in their own town and among their own kin and in their own house. So um, his family, is, we're saying here, and his own house and his hometown, uh, when they're in Nazareth here, are all um, against uh, Jesus' claims to be a prophet. Luke and Matthew's versions elaborate on that Markan version, because like I say, they are dependent on it. 
The version in Thomas keeps the aphorism maybe even more simple. So the simpler the aphorism, the easier it is to transmit orally, and so maybe, um, maybe this is more close to what it originally would have been, uh, less elaborated. Jesus said, no prophet is accepted in his own village, um, in Thomas 31. The Gospel of John, it's interesting whenever you have a, um, uh, whenever you have a, 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 a buttress, a, a, a separate attestation from John, because the Gospel of John is normally so different from the synoptics. So almost everything that Jesus says in John is um, only found in John, in the Johannine community. But it provides a rare support for this uh, saying of Jesus via a paraphrase. So in John 4, 44, we read, Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in the prophet's own country. And so he, again, had gone to Nazareth and, uh, and has no honor there. So um, there's nothing implausible or anachronistic about this saying, I think. The variants and even that paraphrased report of the saying in John suggests that there is a saying here that is moving around through an oral tradition and different competing communities actually have access to it. Um, like I say, for the historical Jesus, um, who may have considered himself a prophet and who almost certainly considered his hometown to be Nazareth, the town of the village of Nazareth in the Galilee, uh, north of Samaria, north of Judea, um, there's nothing implausible. That's not anachronistic. Uh, to, have, to imagine that the historical Jesus would feel that way. But interestingly though, and so this is, this is actually giving it a plus in terms of connection to the historical Jesus, it is not fully aligned with what you might expect a later Christian apologist to do. So later Christians who have um, become convinced and who are tested, convinced by Paul's ideas, uh, Paul's Christology, they probably, and other, there are other Christians too who have different ideas of uh, the messiahship of Jesus, they may want to em emphasize their understanding of Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as the Christ, um, and rather than just being a general prophet who is uh, not respected in his village. I mean, there's nothing that says Jesus can't be a prophet and the Messiah, but in any event, this is a, not the emphasis that you would make later when we're really focusing on Jesus is uh, the Christ. Also, um, we've talked before when we have uh, uh, done our um, lecture on the Christmas stories, the stories that the uh, evangelists who are the authors of Matthew and Luke make when they independently um, say that Jesus uh, was born in Bethlehem and have to go to great lengths to explain why a guy who is called Jesus of Nazareth could how he could possibly have been born in Bethlehem. And why do they do that independently of each other and create two totally contradictory accounts of how Jesus could have been born in Bethlehem? It's because there is a um, Old Testament prophecy in the book of Micah that is widely regarded, was widely regarded by early Christians as messianic prophecy. So in other words, a prophecy of what would happen to the Messiah, you know, but you, O Bethlehem, you know, uh, not, not, you know, you are not the least of all the towns because um, uh, a, a prince is going to be born to you and that kind of a thing. So in other words, the Messiah will be born there. Differences from later Christian, there are differences then, whenever we have these kind of differences, from later Christian understanding, um, that means it is less likely that later Christians would have made uh, those, those things up. So they might not have ever come up with a, um, you know, a story that, uh, that Jesus is not a prophet who's not respected in his hometown. That also seems kind of embarrassing. Why would you make up that detail? <laughs> so so they, that this, um, because later Christians would presumably be embarrassed that to say Nazareth is Jesus' hometown because he's from, uh, uh, they're not that embarrassed because they have, they have explanations for it, but they would rather have him be from Bethlehem, as we know, um, that they would rather have him be talking about himself as a prophet and they probably would rather have him not 
be disrespected by anybody anyway, that you wouldn't that there's less likelihood to make that up. So these are criteria that make us say, well, maybe maybe this one um, has um, some reasons to connect it to the historical Jesus for us. Lots of different criteria. Let's look at um, the saying uh, of that is recorded in very, again, multiple at, um, attestations. So it's recorded in multiple different places that Jesus says regarding the first and the last. So Jesus' teaching about the first and the last uh, is also in many sources, in this case, Mark, Q, and Thomas. So again, not John. It's very rare that John has a um, parallel, uh, but there are some. So we also have versions from Matthew and Luke who are drawing, in this case, from both Mark and from Q. So we have, um, like I say, a Mark version and a Q version. So the Mark version is, uh, Jesus says, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So as we've been talking about, uh, you know, with the, do, the two source hypothesis that the authors of Matthew and Luke have both the text of Mark and Q in front of them, because Q is lost, it has to be reconstructed from Luke and Matthew. Because of that being the case, the points where Q and Mark overlap are very difficult to disentangle because again, um, we don't have the Q document to check what it would be like. So in this case though, Matthew gives us some confirmation of this whole theory by presenting a doublet. So we have maybe, if, how do doublets work? So Jesus has this original aphorism, this original teaching, uh, the last will be first, and the first will be last, whatever the original would be like in Aramaic, that goes through that oral tradition a version of it gets written down in Greek in the Gospel of Mark. A version of it gets written down in Greek in the Gospel uh, of Q, which is now lost. But the author of Matthew has both those texts. And rather than editing them together and just using the it once, Matthew actually takes the two variations and includes both of them because Matthew um, has, uh, is much more interested as a harmonizer. And he, Matthew doesn't, likes, prefers to not delete anything of Mark if Matthew can, and not to delete anything of Q, because Matthew, even though Matthew would prefer to tell the story differently and wants to include a different spin on things, um, he still kind of clearly thinks of these two source texts as being authoritative. So he doesn't want to fully change them or delete things. And so in this case, we have two variants that are not the same as each other preserved in Matthew. So Matthew 19.30 repeats that saying that is found in Mark, which makes sense because Matthew has that text of Mark and we can check it against Mark. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. But then there's this doublet variant in the next chapter of Matthew, which is drawn, we can presume, from Q, or we are presuming anyway from Q, or hypo hypo hypothesizing. <laughs> and it is, though, a less comfortable but a more memorable saying. So in this version, it's also in Matthew, it says, so the last will be first and the first will be last. It's not many of the last will be first. It's the last will be first and the first will be last. So we can presume then working independently and having access to both of those two sources, the one that is Mark and the way it's in Q, um, Luke has preferred, because Luke actually is a pretty amazing uh, synthesizer and writer and gets rid of all the seams, and so Luke does like to edit, and Luke will delete Mark. So Luke thinks more highly of Luke's self than the sources that Luke has, which is less true of Matthew. At least we can tell from uh, the editorial um, ways that Mark is edited by Luke compared to Matthew. And so the, we only have a single teaching, which is, indeed, some are, last, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. So, so that 
considerably softens the teaching, right? So it's not everybody who is, um, is poor and is on the ground and uh, is on the bottom of the social hierarchy is going to be on the top and everybody at the top is going to be on the bottom. It's, it's now been softened to some of the last will be first and some, of the first, uh, uh, some are the first who will be last. Um, so a much less provocative teaching and it also um, rolls way less off the tongue and so we can see presumably how Luke has, has edited that to um, not have such an uncomfortable teaching maybe. We also have a variant in the Gospel of Thomas and this kind of follows the Thomasine community's theme of achieving a kind of a spiritual oneness. And so we have many, for many who are first will become last and they will become one and the same. And so oneness and sameness is um, the achieving oneness, achieving true, the true spiritual insight is a, is a theme of the Thomas community. So of all of these then, the Q version that is preserved in Matthew, so the last will be first and the first will be last, that's the so shortest, it's the strongest, most memorable version, it's the least comfortable version, it's not a teaching, it's a teaching that would challenge you and provoke you. Um, if you're not doing that bad, if you're kind of a rich person, you kind of don't like this, even though you're, you like Christianity or you're, this is, you're, you're attracted to this religion, this is, maybe a, a, um, this is maybe a harsh prediction. And so anyway, it might be therefore that this is the most, the most authentic version to the historical Jesus. Like I say, other variants either soften the teaching or also add concerns that are um, part of the later uh, individual communities like uh, the concern for spiritual oneness that is here in the Thomas version. Um, and again, it's not a, there's no, it's a, it's a, now it's become a kind of hybrid saying, right? So the one is last will be first, the first will be last. By adding this, they'll become one and the same that um, makes the saying less pithy, less memorable. Um, it seems to have been a, a saying that has been altered, right? So, although we have a lot of the sayings with multiple attestation, that's not our only um, criteria. And, and we've kind of, I've kind of even shown how um, we're using all of these in, uh, in tandem, even when we have uh, that multiple attestation. More often, multiple attestation is lacking. Uh, and so, you know, yes, and almost everything that is in Mark is also in Matthew and Luke, but that's not an independent source, right? So the um, Matthew and Luke are pulling that with Mark as a source. So in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> so, I mean, the Pharisees and the teachers of law are very much about adherence to uh, Jewish law. The Pharisee movement will ultimately evolve into rabbinic Judaism, um, and then will have identified uh, an entire practice of uh, legal observation that um, has existed now since late antiquity and through the Middle Ages into um, modern rabbinic Judaism. Um, it won't have been developed uh, that way yet, not, not all of those rules and everything like that. It's just a, a new emerging thing in the first century. Um, but uh, this is a pretty strong um, uh, statement from Jesus here, or put into Jesus' mouth. This is set as a saying of Jesus that Christians have to adhere to um, Jewish law. And if you teach otherwise, 
you are least and you're not going to get into the <laughs> kingdom of heaven if you, if you teach against that. So, so we've argued in our um, lecture that we had last month on, on the Pauline church, uh, where Paul teaches exactly the opposite of this, um, that the Matthaean community, the community here where this saying or this gospel is being um, written, is writing uh, to express their view that, no, we have to maintain adherence to Jewish law. Everything that Paul is telling you about that is wrong. So these sayings um, from, the author of Math, or from the author of Matthew's independent tradition, the Matthaean community material, they are not supported by multiple attestation. In other words, there is no parallel teaching in any other, or any other independent witness uh, of this saying that not one jot or one tittle, not one stroke of the pen will be changed. It is only found here. So that doesn't mean all by itself that the teaching is inauthentic to the historical Jesus, but there are a lot of other considerations. So I was just talking about uh, the Why Paul's Church is One lecture. And so this is a core of the debate between, uh, in early Christianity, between Paul and his rivals. So it is at the core of the debate in the 50s and 60s and 70s, let's say, especially 50s, anyway, all the way up through the 70s, anyway, the middle of the first century of the Common Era, that is what Christians are fighting about. And so um, Matthew's inclusion of this teaching, the author of Matthew, uh, about the need for this shows how you know, strongly um, uh, they support uh, adherence to law as opposed to Paul. And so I'm going to say that this is an anachronism. So the historical Jesus uh, lived before Paul. He became Christian. Paul was alive, but he, hadn't, he wasn't part of the movement. Um, and it was long before Paul's uh, decision and insight uh, that the new Gentile converts to the movement uh, did not have to adhere to Jewish law, and in fact, that Christ's uh, sacrifice had made, had fulfilled the law, and that that meant that adherence uh, was no longer incumbent. And in fact, ultimately, after he was fighting a lot, as we saw, that it was actually um, denigrating to what Christ did if you continued to adhere to law, you're being not Christian anymore for Paul. So because this uh, statement of, that is attributed to Jesus, the saying, um, is so contextualized for a time period after the historical Jesus. Nobody in the historical Jesus' community was arguing this. They were all, um, they were all Jewish Christians. They're not Christians yet even. They're all part of this movement and they all consider themselves Jewish. They're a sect of Judaism and they would have all been adhering to the level of Jewish law adherence that uh, people in their time and place uh, were doing. It is only later that people have this argument and that the Matthaean community needs to put these words into um, the, their scripture, the Jesus Christ of their scripture, not the historical Jesus. So I, my, my judgment here is very likely to be inauthentic because of this anachronism. Um, you know, if we're going to do, though, can't rely only on multiple attestation because there are some of... Um, uh, Jesus' most famous teachings that lack multiple attestation, including things like the parables of the Good Samaritan and the prodigal son. So probably, uh, probably these two are the number one parable that anybody would say. If you say, what are the parables of Jesus? We probably, these are, there might be something else that's the top, in the top three, but I think maybe these are the top two. These exist only uh, in Luke. And so um, there how, are, however, um, even so, the fight that they, they don't have any other um, uh, attestation, there's no other witness of them in another community, they are not problematic in the sense of there's no anachronisms. The parable, I'm sorry, the characters in the parable, for example, of the Samaritan, the Levite, the priest, the Samaritan himself, those all fit into the Galilean Jewish context of the historical Jesus. So that's not something that the historical Jesus wouldn't have known about or that existed after his time. Those are all stock characters in the historical context of his time. In addition, as parables, um, these stories have 
a memorable structure. They are the kind of thing that can survive oral transmission. You can learn this story um, in an oral transmission society especially. We don't have this capacity. We have to look everything up. That's why I have such trouble even doing basic quotes when I'm trying to pull them out of my head. I don't, I don't memorize word for word things anymore. I memorize you know, sort of themes. Uh, and that's why I'm able to pull, pull a lot out of my brain, but I can't pull everything out of my brain that way. Uh, people in ancient societies, which they had so much less access to information and books, they were way more likely to just be able to memorize huge amounts of, of um, texts that are written. I'm sorry, that's not written. Texts that are, com it's not text, words that are composed, <laughs> you know, to be repeated and memor memorized and competed, repeated. So one of the ways you can have that is, for example, like a threefold structure. So in the parable of the Samaritan, you know, we have a Levite come past him, then a priest, and then the Samaritan himself. So that's a threefold thing. And so when you do those kind of literary, um, uh, in this case, oral tradition uh, forms, they just naturally speak to how the human brain works. And so they're easier to uh, recall and repeat. Um, that said, <laughs> because we lack, I mean, I think almost, I think, I think Everybody who is a Christian scholar would want these to go back to the historical Jesus, and I think most scholars probably, I think most scholars probably do see them as going back to the historical Jesus. You have to be a real minimalist, uh, which is possible, to not. However, because we lack multiple attestation to confirm that they were being transmitted in the oral tradition, the case can very much be made that both of these are the creation of the author of Luke or the Lucan community, because we don't have the att multiple attestation to show otherwise. Um, some controversial uh, statements of Jesus lack multiple attestation, as with Matthew 19, 12, 11 and 12. He said to them, not everyone can accept this teaching, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. So this is a um, weird teaching. <laughs> it is a teaching that um, I think most uh, any Christian who wants to, you know, uh, think about this would prefer to think about it entirely symbolically rather than literally, <laughs> you know, and that's not a, as a, not a commandment to, uh, to become a eunuch, uh, but rather it has a, a symbolic idea. But that's, that said, the fact that it's actually troubling and it's difficult um, is actually one of our criteria that says, well, maybe it does go back. Likewise, um, you know, we have this threefold structure, so um, you, it would be easy to transmit this kind of an idea uh, that could survive oral tradition. And so, you know, I, f I feel like we have to remember when we're doing this, we can't just put our thumb on the scale and say, oh, well, the, 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 the sayings that we really like are the ones that are authentic and the ones that we think are weird or that we really don't like aren't. Um, we have to uh, use all of these criteria um, uh, dispassionately. They're going to use them validly. Um, so like I say, there's also should be a, a, a caution to avoid any kind of partisan te temptation. Um, and so there's, for example, a um, declaration that Jesus makes in Matthew 16 um, uh, that has long been used to justify the idea of papal primacy and papal supremacy. Uh, and so for those of us who are not um, in favor of that uh, proposition, who are not uh, Catholic as a result, um, probably would prefer the fact that, uh, you know, that it doesn't have multiple attestation and so on. So we read this uh, text that says, uh, Jesus is saying to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my, but my Father in heaven. So he's responding to, um, just before that, Peter, Peter has given his testimony that Jesus is the Messiah. 
And Jesus continues, I tell you that you are Peter. So this is a um, uh, Simon, his disciple Simon's nickname, which we do know through um, multiple attestation that there is this name change where um, there's a nickname uh, where Jesus calls this particular disciple uh, Rocky in the different languages, the rock. Uh, therefore, you are Peter, you are the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So, um, uh, so in this case, uh, even though I'm, like I say, there's a caution to be partisan on any of these, in this particular case, uh, it, it'll, it would weigh into the direction that people who uh, would like to argue against uh, primacy it's get on their side. So there are anachronisms here. So Jesus is talking about founding a church, but really church idea of church really only emerged after his death. Um, when And even there, we're actually consisting of actual different communities with very rival interpretations of what the qualities essential to Christianity are. Um, each of them are claiming rival apostolic authority and because the Mathean community here is uh, essentially claiming Peter's authority, this seems to be an argument that they are making that Peter is the lead apostle and he is backing them up in all the things they're saying about law and observance. Whereas, for example, um, the Gnostic communities uh, down the street uh, who are claiming that Thomas and um, uh, and Mary Magdalene are Jesus' ch chief apostles. They are writing uh, stories that denigrate Peter and that are saying that Jesus is giving um, uh, the secret teachings, uh, the true teachings, only to um, Thomas or only to Mary. So anyway, as pleased as non-Catholics might be to inauthenticate this particular teaching, <laughs> We had to be very fair and nonpartisan. So we would actually, if um, using of all these criteria, also cleave away many other teachings that um, partisans would be loath to give up. And it would also include ones that we maybe would be less likely to keep. So this is actually why I'm suggesting that all of this should be an academic historical exercise and not a theological religious one. Uh, by that I mean, what's important really to Christianity is not the historical Jesus, it's the Jesus Christ of Scripture anyway. This is a different exercise. This is an academic exercise. Okay, uh, the saying to love one another. Um, we've been talking about how uh, the Gospel of John preserves a very different uh, tradition. Um, and so during the Gospel of John's version of the Last Supper, recorded in chapter 13, Jesus says, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I will tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Um, so once again, this famous teaching is preserved only here, so it lacks any multiple attestation and independent witnesses. Um, this is obviously a teaching I think that Christians would like to say, oh, this should be authentic to the historical Jesus, as I've loved you, love one another. This new commandment, uh, love one another, um, is a, a very beloved. Um, just as, but just, and just as the Mathean community, as we've talked about, has this affinity for Jewish law, Love is really a core theme in the Johannine community. So, for example, in the first epistle of John, which is by another author in this same though community, it teaches God is love. And so, right, we read in chapter 4, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. 
And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Um, so the variance and even, oh, wait. Nope, that's the, uh, we've already had that slide. Uh, oh well, so a slide got re uh, replaced and I have the wrong slide there for this. So what, what do we say about this? Unfortunately, um, uh, there is, let me just make sure I don't have it. Okay, I don't have it. So I'll explain what it is without the slide. So don't look at the slides. <laughs> so when we go back to this and we were just talking about this, you know, um, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. So um, this is written in retrospect. It's not likely the kind of thing that uh, the historical Jesus was saying. Um, it's, it's written by the community in retrospect. The community was very confused um, when Jesus was, um, uh, was crucified. And, and, a, and a more, more clear anachronism, he says, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now. So the historical Jesus in no way and on no occasion would have ever talked to anybody as a, 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 described a group as the Jews because, again, he and all of his disciples were Jews. They are a sect of Judaism during the time period of the historical Jesus. By the time, um, by the time this story is written, by the time these, um, these traditions are written in the Jahanim community, the Jahanian community has been kicked out of the synagogues and now they feel themselves as having totally separated and they're their own uh, emerging religion, the Christian religion, uh, and they are looking at their former co-religionists, formerly of a different sect, now of a totally different religion, and they are calling them the Jews and they're seeing them as rivals. And so um, words like this where uh, Jesus is is talking about the Jews are being put on his lips, but this is an anachronism that would therefore not go back to the historical Jesus, no matter how much the, the rest of it you'd like uh, to be. Okay, so there is a natural tendency to want to soften harsh, harsh teachings, and we saw that before in some of the, um, uh, in some of the variants that we've had. And so that likely also explains the difference between Luke's and Matthew's variations of the Beatitudes, both of which are likely drawn from the saying source. And so we kind of teed this up when we were talking about that meme. So in Luke's version, it, we read, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But in Matthew, we have the softened teaching a very harsh teaching is with the poor who get the kingdom of God. Um, here in Matthew, that teaching is spiritualized. Blessed are, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, and that's a special phrasing. The author of Matthew um, always deletes God and puts in heaven because that's their, how they call it in, in their community. So um, even though I have these two variations, uh, this really important teaching, the Beatitudes, actually is dependent on the same source, Q, so it lacks uh, multiple attestation. Uh, another one of the um, criteria that we've mentioned as a disqualifying are apologetic statements. They have less likelihood to reach to the um, historical Jesus. And so many times we've talked about how the connection of Jesus and John the Baptist is one of the things that has lots of multiple attestation. So we have it in Q and Mark and John, but it's also a source of embarrassment for early Christians due to the implication that it must mean that if John was doing the baptizing of Jesus, that Jesus is looking to John for authority. That's an implication. And also, since John is performing a ritual for, re, uh, for redeem, redeeming sins, for remish, remitting sins, uh, then it, the implication is that Jesus has lived a sinful life, um, neither of which are the kind of things that later Christians would have um, made up. 
And indeed, we can just see again and again and again in the Gospels how they are trying to say, no, no, no. In fact, maybe if you're a Christian and you're listening to me and you say, oh, no, 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 John didn't have authority because we have all of these statements that say otherwise. John put into John's lips, uh, you are greater than I and that kind of thing. Um, I'm not fit to uh, unclasp your sandal. So sayings of Jesus, though, those are sayings that are Christians have put into John's mouth. Sayings of Jesus that make Christian apologetic arguments, such as Jesus' words to John, are therefore very unlikely to be authentic. So at the time of the baptism in Matthew's version, Jesus says to John, when John's like, uh, why, why on earth would you need to be baptized? If anything, you should be baptizing me. You know, you don't need to be baptized. But Jesus said to John, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. So uh, they're very law-abiding in the Mathean community, and so that is their excuse for why um, this ritual needed to happen. Uh, in other words, this thing that was a well-known story going back to the um, uh, historical Jesus that ba John the Baptist had baptized Jesus. And so now this saying of Jesus is therefore very, very unlikely to be authentic to the historical Jesus. Um, one other uh, category I guess I want to consider is um, ap ap uh, apocalyptic prophecy. <laughs> so we've done a lot of lectures on apocalypses and uh, apocrypha, uh, pseudepigrapha, other texts that are floating around in this time period the second temple period of Judaism, and it is a time where we have a flourishing of apocalyptic prophecy, which often takes the form of pseudonymous writing, which is to say writing in the name of a prophet in the past, pretending that you are that prophet, you're writing the, uh, the apocalypse of Abraham, what Abraham is having a vision of in the future, and that future that Abraham is seeing is your future, I mean, it's your time, and so Abraham is able to predict all the things that you are, are your past, and then it gets to your time, and then Abraham predicts your immediate future, and then that has influence on your community because that is, that is telling them of what they need to know in their time. And so a huge component of apocalyptic prophecy is retrojecting predictions. So... Uh, most of it is not a prediction. He, they're going through and telling the past from the perspective of the author, but from the perspective of the pretend author, it is in that author's future. <clears throat> and then that is used to give the text legitimacy. Wow, they've been getting it spot on. They predicted all those things, all those things happened, and now it's continuing to predict things that are going to happen right in our immediate future. And so the community takes that as authoritative, but... Um, <laughs> as is want to happen in actual history, now that we're living past all of those times, it turns out that all of the future predictions all did not come true. So in other lectures, we have seen, for example, how the author of the book of Daniel does exactly this, accur accurately predicting the events of his recent past. So everything from when uh, the character of Daniel would have existed all the way up until when the author lived, which is somewhere between the year 167 and 163 BCE, based on bullseye predictions and very particular predictions that are going all the way up until that moment, and then completely catastrophically failing after that, um, including the prediction that the world was about to end in their own near future, uh, a prophecy which very importantly did failed. So the Son of Man did not come in clouds, hailing the end of the world. Um, any time in the 160s or 150s BCE, but just because the um, prophecy failed, that hasn't stopped people from wanting to recalculate and, um, and reinterpret uh, the text, interpret the text incorrectly in order to make a new um, false prediction of the end of the world, the end times. One such... Um, person who loved Daniel and felt that he had actually now had access to the new um, 
the, the, he knew what, the, what, it, what it really meant. It wasn't going to happen back in one, the 160s or 150s. Um, the Daniel, as he understood it, you know, it wasn't really Daniel as a guy in the 160s, but Daniel uh, was predicting his time. And, and he has got all the signs he needs because there is nothing that could be worse than the Roman uh, Jewish war, which resulted in the total destruction of Jerusalem, killing everybody, the inhabitants, uh, destroying the temple itself, taking every, all of the artifacts, uh, all of the relics back to Rome uh, for the uh, tr uh, triumph, the Roman triumph. So the author of Mark then seeing those as signs, reinterpreting all of the things in Daniel, um, retrojects his own apocalyptic predictions by putting them into Jesus' lips when he is writing um, the Gospel of Mark. So updating um, the sign of the end times in Daniel, the author of Mark has Jesus predict when you, when people in the future here, when people in Mark's time, when you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it not, ought not to be, let the reader understand. What am I meaning by that? This is the desolating sacrilege. This is something that is also talked about in Daniel, where it is referring to the temple being uh, desecrated, in that case by the Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Now it's been updated here so that it's the Roman general, setting up the, uh, their legionary uh, symbols in the time, uh, the de destruction of the temple. When you see the desecrating sacrile sacrilege set up where it ought not to be, the temple, let the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. So the Christian community fled, uh, which is what happened too. The one on the housetop must not go down or enter into or take anything from the house. The one in the field must not turn back to get a coat. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not be in winter, for in those days there would be suffering such as not been given uh, from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. This is it. This is the end times. Um, and it was, of course, a horrific time of suffering uh, that the author of Mark is reacting to. This will then lead, after a bunch of signs and portents, this leads swiftly to the end of the world um, sometime in the 70s uh, uh, CE. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and that will signal the literal end of the world. Um, in case uh, all of my decoding of this cryptic sign, the desolating sacrilege, set up where it ought not to be, let the reader understand, that's a thing that is taken from the book of Daniel. Luke, who is writing to um, a less informed Gentile audience, just edits Mark when it comes into Luke and makes it clear. Luke says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. So, you know, you don't have to have this coded phrase. Luke is just fixing it. When the Roman armies come, that's going to be the end time is coming near. So apocalyptic predictions like this, uh, like I say, are written by anonymous authors to explain their understanding, which they really believe, um, of their own time and place. Uh, however, they're also failed prophecies because, um, as we know now, 2,000 years later, the Roman destruction of Jerusalem did not lead to uh, the immediate literal end of the world. Uh, that didn't happen before this generation passed away. It didn't happen in a space of a little time. Uh, the, the little time left, the generation passed away. The Son of Man did not come in the clouds with power and glory in any literal sense. So when I say failed prophecy, I just mean a literalistic interpretation of the prophecy failed. So, like I say, because of this, information about these events in the 70s of the Common Era, that's something that is very... Um, on the mind of the author of Mark, but it is totally anachronistic to the era of the historical Jesus. And so again, this kind of teachings are not uh, authentic the, from the historical Jesus. They are authentically part of the Jesus of scripture tradition uh, and, can be, and can be used that way. So uh, just to conclude then, <laughs> as we are doing this, um, when people are reading the scriptures, 
they are seeing um, and experiencing the Jesus Christ of Scripture, and if they're doing that in a religious sense, that can point them to the risen Christ. But the Jesus Christ of Scripture is not the Jesus Christ, uh, uh, not the Jesus of Nazareth of history, the historical Jesus. It's the different component art pieces, um, the same way that we had uh, that artistic theological portrait, these are an artistic literary portrait that were written by Christians who already believed in the risen Christ and whose uh, beliefs informed what they were writing, the picture that they were painting, that also informed them in their beliefs and also the gospel writers, uh, is the Hebrew Bible, as translated into Greek, the Septuagint. Um, there are, is a memory and teachings of the historical Jesus that's preserved. Some of the details, like his um, baptism by John, some of these sayings um, do seem to, and most likely seem to go back to him for various reasons, as we've kind of assessed. But really, the way we're accessing the historical Jesus is through these academic disciplines. And so... Um, We'll go ahead and start getting questions, and I also have a bunch of resources that maybe I'm going to um, recommend to you as we're doing this. Are you putting questions in the queue, Landra? No. I'm seeing the queue, but I'm not seeing any questions. Okay, well, I'll begin by thanking people for their support so much. Ron Wagner, uh, Jay Lung, Mark, uh, Jay Jung, L. Jung, I'm sorry, not Jay Lung, <laughs> it's Jay L. Jung, um, Mark Long, Aries Aurelian, Andre UC uh, Freer, Daryl Scott, Mike R., um, Tina, um, Tina writes, usually I have lots of to say, but tonight I just want to support uh, Community of Christ, respect your hearts, and appreciate John's, appreciate John's scholarship. Thank you, Tina, so much. Uh, Tommy uh, Schmeirer and Matthias, uh, who wants to express his appreciation for John. Hi from Austria to you all. Hello uh, from in, to everybody in Austria. Uh, I've had a lot of... Fond memories of travel to Austria was the first, uh, going to Vienna when I was a kid in the, uh, with the Minnesota Boy Choir was uh, the first overseas destination. I've always loved um, Austria and Vienna since. Uh, and thank you, JM. Um, let me mention, so we have kind of, I don't always remember to bring um, resources. Uh, and let me you, give you guys a few of these this time. So I went through a lot of these uh, details with criteria. Uh, of how, how are we finding these tools. And so I'm gonna recommend a few books uh, quickly and we'll put these later in comments. I forgot to give these to Landro ahead of time <laughs> to do that. Uh, there's a whole series by John P. Meyer called A Marginal Jew. And he goes through and discusses, um, essentially, can I do it this way? Yeah. He discusses all of these criteria in kind of exhausting details and um, if you, I'm pretty minimalist. He is way more maximalist. Um, I'm a pretty, uh, I would say I'm a pretty, um, you know, kind of far progressive uh, scholar. He's going to be about as conservative in terms of maintaining stuff uh, for a Christian audience as you can do and still be a scholar <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So this would be, might be a book for you if you uh, find me upsetting sometimes. <laughs> so um, another book that is amazing, uh, there's a professor here, John Kloppenborg, uh, and he is one of the leading uh, professors on Q. And this book, Excavating Q, um, is also an amazing summary of the entire historiography, which is to say the history of the quest for the historical Jesus, all of this academic background. So it doesn't only just tell us anything you'd ever want to learn about um, the Q hypothesis. It tells you everything more. I mean, it is, it is a, such a thorough book, so I couldn't recommend this more. It is, um, these two books are 
very dense though, and so they are, well, I'll give you one more that's dense and then I'll, and then I'll tell you one that, uh, a couple here that are, or one that's easier and more accessible, two that are more accessible. So um, John Dominic Crossan, I've mentioned before as one of my favorite uh, scholars of the historical Jesus, and this book is The Historical Jesus, The Life of a Mediterranean Jewish Peasant. Um, when I was saying you can't put your thumb on the scales and, um, and use these criteria to, to kind of bring in the, the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the sayings and things that you like while trying to get rid of the ones you don't, um, this is, in my view, the book that is so methodologically sound where uh, John Crossan really, um, really adheres to that. So it's really good. Um, in terms of, um, now those are very dense books. Those are academically less approachable, all the ones I've just mentioned. You know, Bart Ehrman is amazing on all of this and so uh, accessible as well. So he is a great teacher and a great writer and he has a, misquoting Jesus is one of them. Uh, but he has a lot of uh, texts that are on this topic. And then I'm also going to mention, um, if you like this kind of comparison, um, the five Gospels. This is a book by the um, Jesus Seminar, so Funk is the um, leading editor. Um, this is interesting because it's a whole collection of scholars uh, who are looking into these questions. I'm, I'm not... I'm not fully convinced of their methodology and how they vote, and so I wouldn't take the, they have a, but it, it's very approachable. So I wouldn't take their color coding as canon, but it is an, very interesting, and more, more important to me is the, um, as a reference where it's showing uh, uh, where, where all the attribute, where the, where the sources are coming, where there's multiple attestation, uh, and different, and the, and the different commentary. So anyway, those are different ways that you can, follow up on this, in no way did I give you a comprehensive list of uh, like authentic, which sayings are authentic. It wasn't my goal here. My goal was to give you a sense of how, um, how scholars approach this and to also give you some uh, further, further resources for, um, for teaching. So let's look at some of the questions or comments. Ricky Palacios says, I once came across a letters in red edition when I asked what made this uh, edition different, I was told that all the words in red were all the things that Jesus said. Um, how, did, how did they determine which saying of Jesus were authentic and which were not? So, so Ricky, in a red letter Bible, they assume that anything that is attributed to Jesus is said by Jesus. So, and that is true in terms of the Jesus of Scripture. So everything in the scriptures where it says Jesus said, and then, and then it's in red, that is what the Jesus of scripture says, and that is authentic to scripture. But uh, that is how they determine it, because it's in the scriptures and it says he said it. That is not though uh, the same as history. Videos for stuff said, do you think the historical Jesus had a strong belief in everlasting life? Uh, would that have been strange for a person in his time and place? Um, I think he did have that. I think he has teachings about that. I don't think that would have been a strange belief at all. Um, I think that was, so there, it was a thing that was definitely in question. So um, the different, different Jewish sects had different ideas. And so um, uh, the most conservative sect, the Sadducees, didn't believe uh, in everlasting life because they were holded more towards um, you know, just the Torah, uh, texts that had been from the very earliest, part, edited together in the very earliest part of the first temple period before there was a lot of uh, Greek and Persian influence. And so the Greek and Persian influence though had, had blown that all up and then so now you have books like Daniel that, um, uh, that are really important to people in the Jesus movement. Um, and maybe also probably also to Jesus himself. So yes, I think he would have um, had a strong belief in that, the historical Jesus, and I think that was not strange because uh, that was also true for the, the Pharisees, for example, and the Essenes too. Um, so lots of sects did believe that. Patrick Kish, um, did Jesus, I'm, I'm presuming you mean the just historical Jesus, did 
uh, does the historical Jesus believe that he himself is a piece of bread of Christ to be shared with us all in communion, metaphorically speaking, of course. Um, so, so I guess it depends what we're thinking. So, so when, it, when we have even that saying, that's a very early saying that is in Paul that we have, um, you know, this is my, my you know, this is, uh, this is uh, my um, body. Uh, and, but then it also says, do this in remembrance of me. So even though that's an early saying, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, go back to the historical Jesus because there's uh, an anachronism there. So it's written in retrospect. You could make the case, and, and there's no doubt, I mean, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, you know, uh, Meyer here was going to make the case that yes, that would that the historical Jesus would have think that. I would tend to think no. I would tend to think that that's an anachronism. But I'm like I say, a minimalist. But you, um, but scripturally, that is the case. Yes, that is what um, that is the teaching theologically, and that's the teaching of scripture. Religiously, Aries Aurelian says. How literate were people 2,000 years ago? I find all these works incredible and a snapshot of life and living in that time. People weren't that literate. Um, so it was a more, um, we think that uh, the Judean population was somewhat more literate than some other populations because they were so interested in text, but they were still largely um, beholden to a special class of um, literate people, so that's why we are always talking about the scribes uh, in these texts. So there are official people that um, people whose uh, job it is specialized to be able to read and write. And so um, even so, for example, in the Christian communities, uh, when Paul is writing these letters to the Corinthians, there's a couple people in the Corinthian community, Christian community, that are able to read those, and then they sit up in the front and they read for you. And so reading was more of a community activity by far than it is now. Um, it's really only centuries later that the practice of individual private reading and reading without talking out loud um, starts to become a common practice. Uh, and so this would have been, so reading would have been itself a more oral process because it's a public and community process. And the texts, not only is it hard to read them, they're hard to read and write, you have to be quite specialized and know them, so it's a specialized skill that is more difficult back then, too. So it's not particularly widespread. Uh, L. Jung says, um, or Jung, you'll have to tell me later sometime how to say that. <laughs> I've always wondered about um, John 8.44, uh, was Jesus saying that Yahweh is the devil? So I don't have the... John 8.44 in front of me. Do you want to paste that for me, Landro? <laughs> you, uh, and so look, John 8.44 says, yet you belong to your father, uh, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning not holding to the truth, uh, for there is not truth in him when he lies. Uh, he speaks his native language, for he is the father. He is a liar and the father of lies. So, Landry, you're going to have to give me more context before that. What is, who is he? He didn't say who. I have to say, I'm not as focused on John, John when I was doing this, because, again, most things in the, in the Gospel of John are not, um, uh, they're not connected are usually not traceable to the historical Jesus. So, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to skip this and go back. It's too much to read. I'm sorry, I can't answer this. We can. I'll. I'll we'll go back to it. Uh, Ari, no, don't, 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 don't delete. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Kaiwan, uh, Kaiwan F8 wrote, "Is it possible that it was James who was divinely inspired, uh, and his uh, brother got set up, as it were, for martyrdom?" Um, so, so sometimes, uh, Kaiwan, when we have these kinds of, you know, kind of elaborate 
you know, you know, is something possible hypotheses. There is not any, um, we don't have any, uh, th so we, that's not how history works. <laughs> so, you know, history doesn't go through where we have a, a hypothesis that doesn't, isn't grounded in, in sources and we are just trying to ex explain things. We have to work from, you know, when we have actual evidence for anything, we have an existing narrative, we're able, trying to um, describe all of those things. All kinds of, any number of things about the past are possible. None of those things are knowable because we can only access um, the past through uh, the sources and what remains behind us are. We, people, um, I think, tend to approach the past by uh, you know, thinking, well, anything is possible, which it, it is, you know, lots of things are possible, um, but, um, but, but history's not about uh, arguing against uh, counterfactuals because, uh, you know, or, or what might have been, because there's no, there's no evidence for them. So we have to work with what the evidence is. Um, John Phelps says, since Jesus lived near Greek settlements, was there much of a uh, literary tradition in Aramaic, or was it considered a lower status language? There is a literary tradition in Aramaic, um, and so that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, the um, local Jewish people had all switched from speaking uh, Hebrew to speaking Aramaic. It was a higher status language because it had been a um, uh, a language of administration uh, under the Persian Empire and continued to be a language of administration under the uh, Hellenistic Empire, even though the Hellenistic Empires were busily promoting Greek. So Greek would have been a higher status language, but Aramaic was still uh, having a live literary tradition. And so, for example, uh, when I was mentioning the book of Daniel, that is written partially in Aramaic, so it is a um, um, it was even a language of scripture, and some of the um, other apocalyptic gospels were also being written in, in scripture. So, um, so no, it was, a, not a, it was not a fully lower status language that doesn't have any writing. It is a, a lesser status, high status language. Um, Kai Wan says, is it possible the name of the Q gospel was the inspiration for the character in Star Trek The Next Generation? No, I don't think it is. Um, uh, the letter Q is, is a cool letter, people like it. Um, I really don't think that, uh, Gene Roddenberry is famously an atheist. He's not, um, uh, he's generally an atheist and he was not too much of a biblical scholar. <laughs> so, and so I don't think he, that's what he's drawing from. In the same way that um, QAnon has nothing to do with the Q source, um, Q, you know, as, uh, as, as, as a, an initial for queer culture is not related to the Q source. It's just that Q is a letter that we don't use in too many words. It's kind of a cool letter, and so Q gets used for a bunch of things. Um, so Alpha's Cav, so would John put the majority of Jesus' sayings as pious frauds? So no, because, um, so for it to be a pious fraud, uh, the person has to be consciously, um, consciously being a pious fraud. So, uh, so for example, um, like the Mark and uh, the, the sayings that Mark is putting into, uh, the author of Mark is putting into Jesus' lips about the apocalypse, about his own day, that he isn't getting from anybody in any kind of a tradition around him because it is contemporary to him as he's writing that down. And so that, I would consider that to be a pious fraud. Um, I would say the majority, um, so then, then, then there's a huge component of, uh, of the texts and the sayings, things that are happening in the, in the gospels where, where Jesus is just talking like a literary character you know, and so he comes up and he meets a, a person and they, they say something to him and you say something to him. That is a, um, that was considered to be a, a, a legitimate literary device. So they are not intending to say this is a conversation that really happened. This is just uh, how we understood the character will have talked. So that is not, uh, that's not attempting to be a fraud. They're not pretending that they're Jesus and they're not pretending in any way that, um, uh, that they know an eyewitness account of some conversation that people had. Um, and then a huge component of the other um, uh, 
um, sayings are sayings that are coming out of an oral tradition uh, that, that people through the course of that tradition um, understood that that's what Jesus said. So I would say the majority are not um, pious frauds. The majority of the sayings have uh, excuses that are, you know, that we would, they're not excuses, they have reasons that are not uh, fraudulent at the time. Uh, but then there are some people who are making up sayings and putting them on Jesus' lips. So, yeah. So even, even in the Mathean community, you know, when I was talking about how they have the, uh, how they have a um, tradition of, of wanting to adhere to Jewish law, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that those statements, the jot and tittle saying is a pious fraud, at some point or other, a, um, an apostle or a prophet speaking by the Spirit in their community um, might have said that. That had become a famous saying in their uh, community. Uh, and then at a certain point when they're writing this down, they attribute that to Jesus. And so I don't know that that means that um, they, they think it, they don't realize anymore that it didn't come from him. So, uh, Todd Radmaker says, uh, was Paul aware of anything that Jesus said? Um, he, I think if, so again, he thinks that Jesus said, um, that formula incantation uh, of of the that we use in in the in the sacrament, right, in the Eucharist in communion. So he, um, this is my uh, body. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. So um, Paul uh, believes Jesus said those things. Uh, normative asks Bart Ehrman talks about some sayings attributed to Jesus making more sense in Aramaic, while some are basically word plays that work only in Greek. How useful is linguistic analysis? Very useful. So that's a, those are strong, you know, again, arguments. That would be another whole um, tool and criteria that I didn't even list. So, so yeah, if we can say that um, this saying that we have, um, and we only have the Greek formulation, but if, it, if we then speculate what the, what the translation would look like in Aramaic and say, oh, well, in Aramaic here, this is a pun, or, oh, in Aramaic, this would have actually been a stronger saying, um, then we can see that that, that is an argument of, that that saying has a more, more sense across the linguistic divide to back to where the historical Jesus would have been speaking it. So I think it's very useful. It's just difficult to do. Um, so. Uh, Alphascav says, um, can we also just ask you about Mandaeans in general? I'm struggling to find uh, historically centered texts to read uh, on them at all, uh, and suggestions would be amazing. So we had a, um, a lecture maybe half a year ago, who was John the Baptist? And I talk about the Mandaeans there, and I talk about um, some of their texts, which have only recently, I think, been available, you know, broadly anyway in translation, um, their own texts uh, don't, to me, seem to um, represent uh, an independent tradition that goes all the way back. I think that they may, um, at a certain point, they, that, that doesn't mean their tradition doesn't go all the way back. They could be the actual heirs of John's disciples, um, but they at a certain point are responding to maybe Christian um, anti-John apologetics or apologetics that, that diminish John, and then they are maybe writing, um, they are in response writing their own uh, Mandaean apologetics. And so, um, but yeah, there's just less that's been done on them. I don't have um, a good history book to recommend uh, to you on that. Um, oh, Kelly Higgins, thank you so much for your support. Um, Paco uh, BRS says, the Talmud has a saying about Jesus, about using prostitute taxes to build bathrooms in the temple. Does this have any credibility or is it just another attack on Christians? So, so yeah, the Talmud sayings um, are all late. So I think that essentially this is no, it's not an independent witness. It's a, um, the, the break has happened. Uh, there have been sayings that have been you know, 
We have sayings that are very anti-Jewish in the early Christian um, scriptures because when you break apart and go into schism, um, one of the things that you do to, to, to defend your own boundaries is you, you, you have an us versus them and you denigrate the other group. And so um, the early Christians are doing that, the early uh, Jew, uh, rabbinic Jews are doing that too. And so, uh, no, I don't think any, I've, we've looked at all of the different, um, I think sayings in that tradition and I don't, um, and they, they don't go back as far as the, the Christian ones. Um, Scott Worthen, is it still uh, a scholarly fringe idea to attribute the Q source to Jesus' uh, Greek written stump, stump speech to be said aloud in whatever local Aramaic, uh, in whatever local Aramaic he, uh, place he found himself in? Yes, that would be a fringe theory. <laughs> so the Q source is um, maybe the closest to the historical Jesus, but it is, it is not from the historical Jesus. It's not uh, written in his lifetime, it's later. So it includes uh, things that are anachronistic to the historical Jesus. So even though um, sometimes I think scholars uh, give like too much, you know, like if it's a Q thing, it's like that's gold and that makes it the historical Jesus. That's, um, uh, it still has to be read as its own, um, it had its own authors and compilers and editors uh, that are not, uh, that are, are still separating us from the historical Jesus. Aries Aurelian says, uh, was James the protect, protector of the poor and meek in Jerusalem? If so, he was an incredible individual worthy of worship. Um, well, so that, that can be your profession uh, of, of faith, Aries Aurelian. Um, um, and some, some early Christian communities, I think, probably did have a, a, a sense of maybe a broader broader space of divinity. Um, there's some very, very strong, a very strong statement on, on the importance of James in uh, the Gospel of Thomas, for, for example, uh, for, in his, for, for, in, for his sake, the heaven and earth was created or something. So, so in that case, you might be able to attribute the formula worthy of worship to him. Um, in norm, for normally for um, in the mainline Christian community, uh, um, worthy of worship as a formula that is defi defined only for God, so only God is worthy of worship. Um, but of course, Christians in the main line interpret God through the lens of and prism of Trinity. But um, like I say, I'm not telling you how um, how to worship. So um, that like so you can be your profession of worship, and sure, absolutely. And so yes, he was the protector of the poor and meek in Jerusalem. That was what he was doing, um, from what we can tell. Empress uh, God of Spiritual says. Why weren't the Gnostic text added to the canon? So we just had a lecture on canonization. So you might want to uh, watch that whole one. It'll be fun. Um, in general, it's because um, uh, the proto-Gnostics, not the proto-Gnostics, the proto-Orthodox group ended up, ended up winning, and they uh, were anti-Gnostic. And so any texts that uh, had Gnostic ideas, which were um, the people who were deciding what gets in the canon, uh, were opposing those ideas. And so they wrote big, long um, books against them. You know, so they wrote a whole list of what heresies are and why those are all heresy. And that caused all the other leaders who were on their team to reject those from the canon. Uh, and so that's the primary reason why they weren't added. Um, in some cases, it wasn't added because uh, other criteria were not met. So some of them very clearly are, are late. And so the canon, the people, one of the criteria for the canon is that um, texts that are more obviously uh, the oldest texts are the ones that they preferred. Uh, unrecognized talent, thank you so much for your support. Oh, here's the context of the question uh, back from L. Jung. I'm sorry, we, I didn't have this before. So, um, so in, in this question you were asking about John 8, 44, was Jesus saying Yahweh is the devil? You are from your father, the devil, and you choose your father's desires. So Jesus is speaking to a group of Pharisees who change, uh, challenged his teachings and questioned his authorities. So his confrontation is part of a longer discourse 
um, which, where he's defending, where Jesus is defending his own identity, identity as, um, as son of God, um, which is you know, part of the unique um, idea of the, you know, the Gospel of John's completely different narrative. So by the time, the way that the Gospel of John is operating, um, we're no longer really, um, it's no longer even in memory of a historical Jesus, nor is a, the character of Jesus in the Gospel of John walking around as if he was a human. He is walking around as if he is God on earth. So he's already the Son of God and all those kind of things, and that is affecting the um, uh, the people who are the Jews who, for whom this is blasphemy. And so it's really, what it is actually doing here is retrojecting the, um, the fight that is happening between the Johannine Christians and their Jewish um, neighbors who have, have split apart from them. So the, the, in this dialogue that you're referencing, the Pharisees are saying, Abraham is, um, is our father, um, and, and then Jesus says, if you are Abraham's children, you would uh, do what Abraham did. Uh, but 40 of you, uh, I'm sorry, this next 40 is the verse. But now you're trying to kill me. And Jesus says, if, you were, uh, if, if God were your father, you would love me because I came from God. And so, um, and so no, they're not saying, he's not saying that Yahweh is the devil. He's saying that, the, that he represents the true devil, and now that the Johannine Christians have separated themselves out from their, um, their enemies, people who had been the same religion from them, so the Jews, as they're calling them now, um, they are saying, you're not, even, you're not worshiping God and God's son. You are, um, you know, you're, you're, you've rejected God. You're worshiping the devil. And they're not saying that Yahweh is the devil. They're saying that... Um, uh, that their true father now spiritually is the devil. So this is an example of, you know, we were talking about it a second ago was some sayings of Jesus that are in the Talmud that are anti-Christian. Um, this is one of the sayings uh, in the Gospel of John that is anti-Semitic, um, or that ends up being anti-Semitic or is the basis for a lot of anti-Semitism. Uh, Alpha Scav, does John believe uh, parts of history are just inherently unknowable then if the sources don't make it to modern times. Yes, yeah. So almost everything in history is inherently unknowable um, because uh, we just don't have the sources to say. So we can talk about, all, you, know, we, we, you know, and we can regret that. I always don't. People always ask me this question, um, you know, what, what books do you wish had survived that we don't have? Or if you could go back in time and ask somebody a question, what would you ask them? Like, you know, I don't have time to study all the history that we have, you know, so, so I regret it a little bit. There's parts of ancient of history that are unknowable because we don't have the sources, and yet we don't have enough time, any one of us, to, to really um, study what we do have. And so we have a, just this amazing treasure, and I just love learning about all of what we can know. Um, and so, but yeah, we, there's lots, the overwhelming majority of everything that has ever happened, there's nothing we can ever say about it. Almost all the people that have ever lived, uh, we can't know their names or anything about them because they've left no record. So, uh, Catherine's world. Um, the mustard seed, Jesus quote. Um, did he really know that the mustard seeds don't grow into big trees? Is that an anachronism, inauthentic, symbolic from the start, not literal? So, um, so Catherine's world, um, that's a, again, a say, saying that has, um, I think it does have multiple attestation, but it's also a, um, the part, yeah, it is, because it's a, a saying that we have in Mark, and it's also a saying where we have a Q variant, and so then we have a variant that is uh, of Matthew's version of that and a Luke version of that, and so, um, so no, um, it's, not, it's not literally about knowing that it's a, a mustard seed growing into a, a tree. And the earliest uh, version of that, uh, or the, the best version of that, the most authentic version of that, um, it's saying that um, it's a tiny seed and it grows into a crazy big weed, not a giant tree. And so, and so this is one, probably one of the cases where the historical Jesus has this, um, this kind of sense of irony about the kingdom. The historical Jesus is saying here, um, the kingdom of God is like a weed. 
once you once you start once you guys all uh, start spreading this around, it's going to be a oh you can't get mustard out of your garden once you start growing it. It's like mint or something, you know. And so the question is not whether it's going to go big, for the original saying, the uh, the authentic saying. The question is that it's spreading like crazy, and then it provides refuge for birds and other little animals that'll be in there. So um, the kingdom will will do that. In other words, it provides inclusive refuge for the the le the less and least. And so that's an ironic um, or a clever or a smart take on, on um, a cosmic symbol, symbology that had been around since all pagan times. You know, so so uh, God has always been like worshipped through trees. And so, the, you know, so trees are associated with the divine because they stand so tall. And they live multiple generations of humans. They, uh, they connect to the underworld with those, the, the world we live on with the heavens. And so normally you would be talking about the kingdom of God being a huge tree. And um, the historical Jesus here is probably making a, an ironic twist to his, his upside down kingdom of, made up of all of these um, poor people who, uh, who aren't the elites. You know, the last are the first and the first are the last. So not understanding that then, the author of Matthew doesn't like the fact that, uh, that Jesus is calling the kingdom of God this weed. And so he says, no, it grows into the tallest of all trees. Um, and so it's definitely not literal. It's not inauthentic or from the beginning. It's, it's the problem when the transmission starts happening, um, authors don't understand the intent. And they also, they also are embarrassed by it. They're like, I want, my, I want my religion and my kingdom to be this lofty tree. I don't want to be a weed, you know, and that kind of a thing. So um, a lot of times what happens is uh, people are embarrassed by things the founder said and they want to clean it up. Um, Catherine's World says, um, was Jesus a reformer trying to replace uh, warlike, judgmental Yahwehism with uh, Elohimism? Uh, notion of 100% love, 100% good, benevolent, loving God maybe to save Judea from Rome due to the uprising. So, well, the uprising is later. Um, and so, but, you know, he, there are, the, the Rome, Rome is in the immediate context of what he's talking about. Um, and so he is seeing, I think, the, um, uh, the Roman administration of, of the lands to be part of an, uh, an oppressive system. Uh, and he wants to, um, reform that, I think, yes, um, in terms of uh, by, by building this uh, inclusive community where the last are first and the first are last, where the poor are the ones that are granted the kingdom uh, and the, the rich can't get in because they can't go through the, you know, like a camel to go through the eye of a needle kind of thing. Um, I don't know that, I don't think that, um, you know, as you're associating this between Yahwehism and Elohimism, I... Um, I don't think that um, I don't think that the historical Jesus would have interpreted um, those two names differently. So I think that um, those would have been read as synonyms for God, Yahweh, and Elohim. And I don't think that um, it wouldn't have had um, the division that you're making, which it, which for him. But I mean, you can be a perfectly legitimate division division for you in your in your theology. Uh, Michelangelo. I always say Michelangelo, but anyway, thank you. Uh, he says, um, I recently finished reading The Consolation of Philosophy and I loved it. Thank you, John, for the recommendation. I'm glad you loved it. Um, it's a really important book. Um, I, appreciate in, I appreciate yesterday when uh, you re recommended it back to me. It made me, reminded me, yeah, that's a, that's a good book for me to read again right now. So thank you so much. Um, um, so let's find out, asks if I have any overlap with Jordan Peterson's Jungian um, psychological point of view on God. Uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't read that, so I, don't, I can't tell you, I'm sorry. Uh, Kay Tempest Bradford asks, when the Gospel of Thomas was first discovered, some people thought it might be Q, and I know it's not, but do you know if any of the sayings uh, are in part of it authenticating sayings? So yes. Um, uh, so, Kate Tempest, we actually have a lecture on comparing 
uh, the, gospel, the sayings in the Gospel of Q to the sayings of the Gospel of Thomas. So I think you're going to find that super interesting. You don't even have to ask me for it. Let's do a new lecture on that because we've already done a lecture on it. <laughs> um, let's find out, says, uh, why do you think Jesus, Socrates, and Buddha didn't write themselves? Um, so we can't know for the Buddha at all. Um, the, you know, the Buddha, to get back to the historical Buddha is almost impossible. Everything that we have about the Buddha is uh, essentially myths about Buddha. Uh, that doesn't mean there was no historical Buddha. It just means that we don't, I think, it's very, very difficult to recover anything. Um, in terms of Socrates, Socrates had an actual philosophy against um, writing. So Socrates believed that truth was had through dialogue, and dialogue for him was not a written dialogue, the way his student Plato made it into writing, and, it, and that's a, a wonderful thing for all of uh, us for the rest of time, because we can't all debate with Socrates because he has been gone, you know? Um, but that was um, Socrates' um, proposition, that, um, that truth is actually going to be had through engaging in dialogue with with everybody around him, not writing something down. And you can never ask a person who wrote it down a question. You can't tell, hey, why do you think that? You can't, and you can't ask them a follow-up question. They're, they're in control of the dialogue because they've, they've written it down. Um, so Socrates was against that. In terms of Jesus, um, I think he didn't write anything down because the historical Jesus, because uh, uh, his community was a, a very poor people who were illiterate probably. Uh, and who didn't have need for those kind of texts and were not focused on property. They were, uh, and the texts would have been very costly. Being able to write it um, would have been very difficult. Instead, they were um, um, sharing teachings orally, and then they were uh, preaching good news, doing healings and uh, faith healings kind of thing, and, and, and helping others, helping the poor through uh, uh, direct direct action as opposed to concerning themselves about text. Uh, Miguel Angelo again, uh, you ask, uh, do you think the Jesus of scripture as a literary character um, has a lot of infer inspiration from sages like Pythagoras and Socrates since it was written in Greek? Um, so I think so, the, so for some of the uh, yeah, some of the, so some there's always going to be some potential for yeah some literary um, a literary stock figure right and so you have to if you're going to write about somebody who is a sage and you're portraying him as a sage a great teacher um, then some of the you know let's say some of the you might convey him through those same 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 feelings um, I think that the reason why I think that if if let's say um, Luke had been writing from scratch. If Mark hadn't written what Mark wrote, um, Luke might have uh, used like a, 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 somebody like Pythagoras or Socrates way more as a model. Um, instead, though, because the person who got in there first and wrote um, the first kind of narrative and created kind of the, um, the, the sense of how the the literary character of Jesus uh, is portrayed, um, I think that that maybe wasn't as much of um, as the author of Mark's model. So it could have happened more like that, and I think it maybe it has to play some kind of an influence, but, um, but not as much as it might have happened. Oh, okay. So do not forget <laughs> to like and share uh, this video. I am super tired. <laughs> Subscribe to our channel if you're able. Thank you for everybody who supported, and we, uh, we appreciate your donations. If you're able, centerplace.ca/donate. Next week we're going to talk about Ecclesiastes, uh, the agnostic book of the Bible. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>